projects. One was being involved in the Human Genome Project and seeing the potential from the industrialization of sequencing. There was a really amazing gains in productivity that came from industrializing sequencing and then really surprising changes in the way we carried out biology by having the capacity there. And so I saw a real opportunity to apply the same principles to uh, to the another part of the biological process, which is acquiring and manipulating DNA molecules. Uh, and the other part of the experience that drove me in this direction was being involved in a biotechnology company. Okay. Uh, for about five years and seeing the amount of effort that went into acquiring and manipulating DNA molecules just for the very conventional uh, parts. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay, let me constantly, okay. So this will be, we've got another minute or two. Uh, so today a lot of what we do is focused on substituting for activities that could be carried out in other ways with conventional molecular biology. You know, we've done thousands of genes, but most of those are for people who are doing uh, much more conventional biology than people are talking about here. But I think that our guess is that 10 years from now, most of what people be, are doing will be much more the kinds of things that uh, the speakers here have been talking about. Uh, so I apologize for. Not your fault. Okay. Yeah. I was just on vacation in Mexico. Heron already. Uh, so the company was started in 1999 and, and we launched a commercial product in 2001 and right now as I said a lot of our customers are in the conventional biotech and pharmaceutical companies and we have uh, about 70 percent of those at one time or another have bought genes from us and we've produced thousands of genes uh, in the last three years. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on gene synthesis. It's something that many of you are familiar with but some of you may not be. Uh, it's a it's been in use since the late 70s, uh, but it's not something that's been widely used until fairly recently. And it, it really has to do with a couple of challenges that have made it difficult to do. And there's two real uh, errors in the process that make it a little bit more difficult to do than it might seem right off the bat. And one is the errors that arise from the uh, chemical synthesis of oligonucleotides. So oligonucleotide chemistry is an extremely efficient process as organic chemistry goes, but there's an error rate of about one in 300 in the base changes, either deletions or substitutions. Uh, and the other sort of complication in assembling genes is that uh, ligation and hybridization don't proceed with perfect fidelity. So there's not a perfect Watson and Crick uh, interaction in every case. And so it's possible to get gross errors of order. And both of these kinds of problems impact the reliability and in increase the cost of the process. And there have been really three general approaches to doing gene synthesis. There's a sort of one-pot PCR approach or ligation approach, uh, what we call convergent assembly, and a solid phase assembly. And all of these have been described uh, in the literature, I believe. So the um, one-pot or PCR ligation approach is basically to synthesize oligonucleotides that span the gene and then combine multiple oligonucleotides into a single reaction. and create the fragment or the part of the fragment that you uh, desire. And it has a number of uh, compelling advantages. It's uh, simple to do and it works often. And it's the technology that nearly all of the commercial providers and most of the people in academic labs use. Uh, and several groups, including uh, George Church's group here, uh, are integrating PCR assembly with oligosynthesis on chips. And that's very appealing because it could lead to a very low cost assembly technology. Uh, 
there are a couple of limitations from the point of view, at least of commercial applications. And one is that some of the sequences are difficult or uh, impossible to create that way, things that don't PCR, for instance. Uh, and then the, the, there, there's been, at least in the past, uh, problems of getting high quality oligos off of chips. So uh, convergent assembly is a somewhat different approach. You start out with oligos, again, that span the gene you want, but uh, it involves a series of ligation and purification steps, which each involve only two fragments. So you take 40 mer duplexes, combine those to make 80 mers, purify those, combine 80 mers to make 160 mers, and so on, to build a final fragment. Uh, so convergent assembly is, uh, it, it involves a series of simple, very reliable steps, and it'll work on almost any sequence. So we found very few sequences that cannot be built this way, but it is slower and more expensive than PCR. So the technology that we're using for gene assembly now, we call a solid phase gene assembly, and basically it, it takes from the logic of oligonucleotide assembly, or uh, oligonucleotide synthesis, so we add oligos sequentially to a solid support with intervening wash steps. So in this example, you're adding the first duplex, you attach that duplex to the solid support, uh, wash away the side reactions and the unincorporated oligos, add the second duplex, attach, and so on to assemble the full length fragment. So uh, that has a number of advantages. It has the same sort of simplicity that the convergent assembly has. Uh, you can drive the reactions with a molar excess, which isn't possible in any of the homogeneous solutions. Uh, you can wash away side reactions at each stage. Uh, and it's readily automated. And one other advantage is that I think it's, it's very amenable to scaling down the uh, size and reagent volume, and that this may lead to a very low cost approach for uh, all of the synthesis. I'm sorry, we're getting some kind of a, ah, that's what it is. So uh, we've developed a solid phase robot for doing gene assembly that was supported by an SBIR grant from the NIH. Uh, and really, it puts a room full of activity into a single box. Uh, we use it to assemble fragments up to 750 base pairs in length, and then uh, use a recursive strategy after that of assembling those clone fragments. So uh, assembly of whole genes involves putting oligos together, as I described, to build what we call subtargets. Those are cloned, sequence verified, and then released. And then those subtargets are assembled with a similar process to build the final clone. And if you compare the uh, gene synthesis methods, uh, PCR assembly will work on many or most sequences. The costs are low and the speed is relatively high, so you can complete the process in weeks. Uh, convergent assembly will work on essentially all sequences. Uh, we believe that we can build almost any sequence that way. There are sequences that are difficult to clone in E. coli, things with long repeats or uh, toxicity. And solid phase assembly again, is extremely re reliable. Each step in the process is very simple, but because it's automated, uh, the costs are low and the, uh, the time is fast, is faster, faster than PCR. Uh, so our technology, the technology we bring to bear on gene synthesis is a combination of things. There's uh, algorithms, the software designs for breaking a gene sequence down into a series of oligonucleotides that can be built back together. Uh, the convergent assembly technology, the solid phase assembly technology. And we've, with convergent, we've built thousands of genes and uh, hundreds with the solid phase. So we're convinced that both of them are uh, highly reliable. Uh, and we also use a variety of error correction methods to remove the, uh, the sequence errors or reduce the, the rate of sequence errors. And, and again, that improves the reliability of the process. So. We've been uh, doing gene synthesis commercially for about three years now, and we've seen a change in the way people are using gene synthesis. You know, three years ago, people mainly used it on where they didn't have another option, on hard-to-clone genes, hard-to-clone cDNAs, uh, codon optimization, and design proteins. But today we're seeing some companies that outsource some or all of their cloning, uh, and uh, 
we're starting to see more use on large genes, things that are over 2 kb, particularly those that are hard to, hard to PCR. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're also starting to see more use of um, larger constructs, orders in the 10 to 25 kb range, and people building vectors. And uh, today, this year, we're also beta testing uh, a technology that's related to the previous talk, uh, synthetic gene libraries. Uh, and the concept for synthetic gene libraries is very simple. If you can build a single fragment by adding in uh, diversity at each of those addition steps, it's possible to uh, build a library that's highly complex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you can appreciate, given what I, uh, what I said before, that this could be done either with oligonucleotide, with the, so the little colored blocks in here can be uh, codons or oligonucleotide duplexes or large clone fragments. So it's possible, given a, a single technology, to uh, build libraries of very high complexity. And, and actually, that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to people about here today, is that we're interested in uh, collaborations for testing and developing this technology. Our uh, business model for this is just like our business model for uh, gene synthesis. It, it is a fee-for-service, so we're interested in uh, providing this as a this uh, diversity generation technology as a service and are looking for collaborators who have interesting projects. So uh, synthetic gene libraries have a, a number of uh, advantages over the other methods of building diversity, and, and they've been really described well by researchers at uh, Maxigen and other places. And the primary advantage of synthetic gene libraries is that the recombination is very fine. You can get recombination between adjacent amino acids. Uh, the advantages of the synthetic gene library approach uh, that we're using is that because we have an error correction in the process, a larger fraction of the molecules are free of errors and therefore active. Um, so those are the applications that people are using today. Uh, we're now planning projects, and we have quotes out on projects of up to uh, 200 KB. And those are things in a, like bacterial operons, uh, viral genomes, and large mammalian genes. And one of the other points, so we're, we're now moving from uh, reality to uh, fantasy. One of the other points that I wanted to say is that bacterial genomes are within the range of current technology, I believe. I think that the uh, synthesis capacity and the synth synthesis technology we have today is up to building genomes. Uh, we've recently bid on a seven megabase project, and we could scale to building a megabase synth of synthetic DNA a month very quickly. Uh, and we're, we're exploring ideas for genome engineering, and I just wanted to share with you one of those ideas. Uh, and it's very closely related to things that a number of other speakers have mentioned. And the idea is uh, a reduced codon set genome for E. coli. And so what we uh, are considering is synthesizing the E. coli genome without some of the redundant codons. And then you'd be able to use those spare codons for incorporating unnatural amino acids. And I think that this would enable the, a, a lot of different libraries to approach building, or laboratories to approach building a range of new materials, and it would provide a really economical way of producing these novel proteins. And it builds on a huge body of research from Peter Schultz's lab and others about the incorporation of unnatural amino acids into proteins that I think would provide uh, a relatively simple way of, uh, of doing that. Uh, the other advantage of this type of project is that I think that most genome scale projects now are probably beyond our current ability to design the DNA sequences. Uh, I think we could build them, but designing a sequence that was going to work right off the bat with very many changes is at best difficult. Uh, I have a little anecdotal evidence on that, and that is that uh, of the thousands of genes that we've done, uh, a small percentage of those are what I would call engineered uh, genes, where someone's taken an 
completely redesigned a plasmid or designed uh, some of the parts that we built for Drew Endy's class fall into that category as well. And, and our, uh, our observation is that with these engineered fragments, the percentage of those that are hard to clone, that cause cloning difficulties, is much higher than with native sequences. So although only a few percent of our total orders have been for engineered sequences, maybe half of the things that we had trouble cloning were with those engineered sequences. Drew's smiling. Uh, so, and this isn't, we're not asking for function here. All we're asking is that the, the piece of DNA will survive and not kill E. coli or the plasma that it's in. So uh, I think that's just a, a cautionary tale on trying to design large, complex systems today. But I think recoding E. coli is a plausible first step towards genome engineering. Uh, it involves the replacement of the entire genome, but the design issues are a lot simpler. Uh, and I think it would provide a really valuable tool for protein engineering. <laughs> so um, there, the current methods for introducing unnatural amino acids were developed by Peter Schultz's group and others, and they've really demonstrated the, the value and feasibility of adding novel amino acids to proteins. And they really involve two key components, uh, altered tRNAs and is one com <coughs> component and then engineered or evolved um, tRNA synthetases. And both of these have the problem that they may reduce the fitness of the and productivity of E. coli by altering the translation of the native proteins. And the idea with the uh, reduced codon set genome is that you could provide a whole section of the genetic code that would be free from this kind of interference with the background, with the chassis. And so these are uh, two examples of the kinds of altered tRNAs that are used. Uh, the first is a uh, tyrosine, what's called a suppressor tRNA, where the anticodon is mutated to match a stop codon. Uh, and in, at, for some percentage of the time, it will increase, it will insert a tyrosine rather than stopping the protein at that point. And the other is a, a natural frame shift suppressor that has a four base codon. And both of those techniques have been used to incorporate unnatural amino acids. But you can also see that in both cases, they would have many opportunities through the rest of the genome to uh, alter the native proteins. And a, a number of different groups have described methods for uh, evolving tRNA synthetases that are able to accept uh, unnatural amino acids. So native tRNA synthetases are pretty good at avoiding charging tRNAs with the wrong amino acid. So there's a, a requirement to engineer the synthetase to specifically uh, accept a different amino acid. And these methods have been used to incorporate many different unnatural amino acids into proteins and, and in some very interesting ways. Uh, so just in summary, uh, I think the advantage of doing this by altering the genetic code is that it would, it has the potential to improve the viability and productivity of the organism and then thus enable industrial scale production of an unnatural protein. Some of the applications for the unnatural proteins or uh, may, will require very low cost production methods to be really practical. Uh, and it also could allow the use of a number of different uh, unnatural amino acids in a single protein and to allow those to be substituted at many positions in a protein, things that are hard to do with the suppressor tRNA approach. And I think perhaps in the long run, just as interesting, it may allow you to build highly defined polymers using the protein synthesis machinery that don't contain any unnatural, any natural amino acids uh, and branching out into really different, different areas. So the, the, the idea is very simple. Uh, alanine's coded for by uh, four triplets. We'd go through the E. coli genome, and in every case, there's a GCA, replace that with a GCT or a, and a GCC with a GCG. And I, you'll note that I, I'm not proposing just getting rid of the rare codons. I think that there may be some uh, biological use for the codon frequency. So the, the idea would be to try to be as conservative as possible. And this is just an example of a uh, fantasy codon table where 
12 codons are freed up in, in a relatively conservative way. And that requires about uh, 110,000 changes over the uh, 3.7 to 4 billion, million base pair uh, E. coli genome, depending on whether you go with the native one or Fred's uh, uh, shortened genome. And so we would uh, start with the native E. coli, uh, replace the genome with one that only uses 49 codons instead of the 61, free up those 12 codons, and then anyone could use these selective techniques to engineer tRNA synthetases, feed the bacteria the amino acid analogs, and then produce recombinant proteins with uh, these changes. Um, so I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, our thinking about how to build a bacterial genome. Uh, as I said, I think that the design issues are probably the hardest parts at this point. Uh, we would propose to synthesize modules, probably uh, something in the size of about 200 KB, uh, and then sequentially substitute these fragments into an existing genome. And one uh, other issue would be with the quality control, and, and Fred touched on the use of gene tip chips for this. I think with uh, the kind of changes we're proposing, uh, using array hybridization would be a good way to track the whole process. There'll be uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms spread across the entire uh, genome that would let you at very high resolution track, track the substitution of the uh, altered genome into the native genome. Uh, another, I think, important component of a project like this would be to check the functionality of each of these pieces as you go along. And one method of doing that could also be based on the use of uh, gene chips. And it's uh, similar to work that's been done in Ron Davis's lab. And the basic idea is to uh, take a section of the genome, substitute, uh, the, say, a 40 KB fragment of the altered genome, and mix two isogenic strains, one of which has the completely native genome, and the, the second of which has the, uh, a fit, the uh, segment substituted in, and then put it together a 50-50 mix of those two genomes grow them up under the conditions that you're interested in, like fermentation, and then measure the frequency of the SNPs in the end population. And that gives you an extremely sensitive uh, measure of the selective, uh, of the competitive ability of that segment of the genome. And I think, I think it may be necessary to have sensitive measures of function when you're trying to re-engineer a genome because uh, the, the last thing you'd want to do is get three quarters of the way through and find out that you'd accumulated enough small deficits in function so that you couldn't go any further. So, uh, in summary, uh, we built a large number of genes with the technology that's available today, including uh, many fragments in the 10 to 20 KB size range, and we're starting to think about back size projects. And I think that. Uh, the gene synthesis technology is it's really improving rapidly, and but today it's adequate for tackling genome size projects, and that much of the complexity is in the design. And I just wanted to uh, mention one other thing, which we're calling the uh, big DNA contest. And so, what we want to do as a company is to stimulate people to start thinking about using large synthetic DNA fragments and to test. Uh, a new technology that we've got an SBIR grant for, for assembling those large fragments. And so what we're looking for is ideas for a 30 or 40 KB fragment that's scientifically interesting, of use to somebody outside your lab, to a range of other groups, and requires or benefits from synthesis. And basically we're looking for a, a two-page essay on uh, why this is a cool thing to do. And the prize is, uh, we'll build it for you. So you get $100,000 in synthesis to build it, and we'll give you the clone uh, for the person who builds, who has the most aesthetically pleasing 40 KB suggestion. Okay, uh, questions? Yeah. Roger. It, it, as you so rightly indicated, um, it's the rare piece of DNA on a plasma that kills an E. coli. After all, why should it? Um, you know, it's much more uh, that the piece of DNA keeps the plasmid from um, 
from uh, replicating in some way. Now, um, given that the ability to clone uh, it, and propagate any old piece of DNA, uh, one that's not been through the fires of evolution, um, is of clear interest to this community, it strikes me that uh, Fred Blattner, your report on the poor German guy who had that sequence that was just this uh, transposon magnet, it raises the issue that some pieces of DNA may not be stable in clones uh, because uh, they're magnets for something that's indigenous to the E. coli. Those you want to get rid of by using a different E. coli. There's other kinds of instabilities, inverted repeats and so on. I think it might be part of the agenda here over the next year or two for people to parse out more precisely the kinds of things that make a sequence unclonable than had, has been really done thoroughly up to this point. Um, other questions? I have one over there. Yeah, given that it's pretty hard to set up a recombinant DNA lab in a cave, one could imagine certain groups of evil doers who might be really keen to outsource their cloning. Are, are there any steps in place to make sure that Blue Heron doesn't unwittingly provide such yeah. people with the next bioweapon? That's, that's a very good question. It's actually one that we've been thinking about since the founding of the company, actually way before 9-11, although it's certainly come to the fore since then the anthrax scare after that. Uh, basically, we do two things when we see a sequence. One is to analyze it for how we're going to build it, and the second is to compare the sequence to a list of pathogens to make sure that we're not inadvertently uh, building a pathogen. So I think that one of the, today, I think it's relatively unlikely. I, I think there's a lot of easier ways to get your hands on a pathogen than have us synthesize it. Um, but, uh, and there, there, you can certainly imagine ways in which you could design around this scheme that we're using today. But, so I think that over the next few years, what we'd like to do is work together with other groups to try to develop methods for identifying really not methods in our order stream. You know, that may or may not ever happen, but it would be nice to have the capability. Um. So are we correct in assuming that it's around $3,300 per KB? Uh, it's, so the price right now is $250 if you're an academic, $275 if you're an academic. Per, per base. Per base. Um, and the second question is, um, is uh, interspersing uh, natural sequences with the synthetic sequences. Do you do that also? Uh, yeah, we call that, uh, we, we do that as a sort of beta test now for some of our customers. We call it partials because one of the things that people often have is a partially finished CDNA where they've got, you know, nine-tenths of the clone and can't get the last piece. Uh -huh. uh, but yes, uh, the technology, especially the solid phase, the second stage solid phase assembly is really amenable to uh, putting together a mixture. Sure. Synthetic modules. I think there's lots of interesting potential applications that we haven't really um, thought through about people thinking about. Okay. okay. We have a question back in the corner. George uh, Church. John, uh, you mentioned error correction a couple of times. I wasn't clear on what the method of error correction was. Was that just sequencing intermediates or was there something else that you had uh, in mind? Something else. <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> okay, other questions? <laughs> okay, if not, um, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, and we'll recess for a short break. Number five. This should be five, Bill. This is line four. Anything? Four, one, two. Mike, four. Sure. Uh, you want to go ahead and kill the mics and we'll scoot the table.
discussion around intellectual property. Um, the time here until five is, is meant to be a, an open discussion amongst all of us. And um, so just to get started, um, the framework for, 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 for the discussion um, to start off with, at least, will be as follows. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about applications, classes of applications that we might be interested in, in, in going after, and use that as an example to begin to better specify the sorts of things that we're going to care about and thus might want to protect um, in t the context of intellectual property. Um, from that substrate, uh, we'll try and move into a discussion of ownership of uh, biological information or the physical artifacts themselves and what the features of an uh, intellectual property framework might look like if we could start from scratch and specify something that we'd like to have. Um, we won't be able to address the problem of how you would actually do that and whether it would be possible, but we'll get to an end point hopefully where we can bring up some of the tools that we have at our disposal and uh, try and consider whether it makes any sense at all. We're going to stop about uh, 15 minutes before the hour and turn things over to Roger to preposition some materials uh, for tomorrow's risk discussion just to get the thinking going there so it's not all coming at you um, at us at, at, at the last minute. Um, so I'll give one example of an application that I'm personally interested in and then I think we should just try and open it up and see what else uh, folks might like, might, might like might want to make. Um, so this idea actually comes from a discussion Roger and I had uh, a couple years ago, I guess, is the idea of, of being able to implement counters uh, inside cells. Um, and so, for example, if you could take a counter, uh, a four-bit counter, and put that in a worm and couple that to cell division during worm development, you would be able to track events uh, as the worm went from a single cell to 959-cell animal things that were coupled to, 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 to cell division, and that would be cool. And if you had a five-bit counter, you could put that in yeast, and you could study onset of senescence in yeast uh, instead of staining with calcifloor on the bud scars. You could just count and collect cells and do microarrays and maybe reprogram gene expression as a function of age of the cell. And if you had an eight-bit counter and you could count up to 256, maybe that would be cool for studying aging in humans or onset of cancer, or who knows what. Um, so these are examples of, of what other engineers would consider to be modest uh, information processing devices. Um, but they're of a scale that are, are more complex than the artifacts that we're currently able to produce. Uh, I don't know this to be true, but it feels likely to, to be the case that were I to try and make something like this, I might want to make good use of dozens of synthetic transcription factors from Sangamo or Carlos's lab. Um, I might want to make use of dozens of um, engineered proteins from, from Wendell's group, and, and so on and so forth. And so I'm, I'm imagining we're heading to this future where we're going to want to be able to make use of parts in combination. And it feels to me like the current situation is that individual classes of parts are being binned up. Um, and so that's, that's an example of a system that I think is, is cool and would be useful. Um, and I'm not sure how I'm going to get to be able to make it. But before we get to that question, um, do people like or dislike the counters, or do people have other systems of, of modest complexity that they'd like to go after or think, you know, are planning to do? So sorry to put everybody on the spot. It's really meant to be a discussion. Yeah. Sure. There's a mic right there. I think one of the IP issues is, is um, um, what's patentable and protectable. Um, um, one kind of patent that has been traditionally very strong is the material patent meaning the actual physical material chemical composition. Um, for many designs that I think we're considering now in synthetic biology, um, the material composition is almost irrelevant, that you can do the same function with a, a multitude of different particular materials. Um, and so I don't know where IP and patent law protection is going to treat uh, the pure ephemeral, non-material design issues. Do we want to deal with that now, or do you want to? Let's, let's table that. Yeah. I think, the, so just to restate that, um, if you needed a yeah. switch in your system, there might be many ways in which you could implement the switch, and so it's not 
absolutely relevant which particular sequence information is encoding the switch. So let's, let's come back to that issue, information versus function. Um, For what it's worth, nature's switch is a calorie, a calorie is a calorie. Fair enough. So, so, you know. Well, is, is it your intention to induce, introduce an artifact, Drew, uh, just to kind of um, lay out the sets of issues, IP issues that might be associated? So, so the counter is one initial artifact, but yeah. I, I, I'm... Artifact? You something... Made some, thing. Some, Human made thing. Some physical thing that I, as an I engineer, construct. Indeed. Yeah. So, but are there other... You know, what, what systems of modest complexity could people foresee wanting to build? Okay, so to give you an example, um, a set of things that will uh, express your favorite protein at a specified molar level. Mm -hmm. But you often, I think it's also possible to sometimes cover a whole set of applications by, by just cr uh, claiming all of the combinations of the parts. And so you don't, don't actually have to know all the, all the, all the, the interesting bits, uh, all the interesting combinations specifically. But if you have a, a description of a set of promoters, a set of ribosome binding sites, a set of proteins, and a set of um, uh, um, uh, um, receptors, for example, then you can essentially, and you have specific examples of this combination being useful, this combination being useful, this combination being useful, you are likely to be able to get a claim that covers um, all the combinations between this set and this set and this set. So it's a claim that has one one promoter out of the set of these, one, pro one uh, terminator out of the set of these, one gene out of the set of these, and any which way of hooking, hooking them up together. Um, that's the kind, in the industry essentially, that's why you, you try to get a broad claim coverage essentially by uh, going as combinatorial as you can. Uh, and of course, patent office is aware of this and they try to cut it back, but it's you, you, this is a way to essentially get broad claim coverage. Um, so by uh, describing the sets of elements, uh, uh, in different classes and then claiming the combinatorials. Okay, maybe one way to ask this question would be, let's assume uh, this artifact, this counter or whatever it is, then what would the, uh, what would one want to uh, have uh, associated with that artifact in terms of an intellectual property regime or, uh, or a, um, a set of expectations about uh, how people who assembled that artifact from, uh, from sub-assemblies uh, treated those sub-assemblies, et cetera. Um, is it, I guess I'm asking this as a question. Is a counter example good enough to go on with? Um, I was going to answer Drew's first question, but I think um, the counter example is pretty good um, for the reasons that the other, the other um, person from the audience mentioned that it could be implemented in different, using different materials, so it's a, it's a very good example. I was going to give another example of a smart virus that could execute uh, a series of conditional s statements mm -hmm. within a cell depending upon um, what it was designed to do, for example, um, to um, identify and remove HIV from an infected cell. Mm -hmm. So something of that order, that would be a, that would be a medium scale system, I believe. Right. Okay, okay, and that would be perhaps a bit more ambitious, uh, an engineering project. But, you know, I mean, that's... Okay. But that's what they're after, though. Yeah. Okay, so, well, why don't we... Yeah. So, one of the questions that gets raised when... Um, you think about the process of, of, of engineering new biological systems is what is it that you're what is it that you're concerned about? What is it that you'd like to make available or protect, right? And so you can hear three things um, that you can use to break it down. One would be the physical material itself. Uh, the other would be the information specifying the physical material. Um, and the third would be technologies that are useful for either discovering the information or assembling or debugging or manipulating the systems. Um, so one question to pose, right? I mean, some of these questions, the answers seem obvious. Are you concerned about the physical information, the physical material or the information specifying the material? Um, on, at present uh, and in the immediate future, it feels likely that the physical material matters because we still have minus 80 freezers. Um, but if John and others develop synthesis as a technology still further, 
uh, the information becomes limiting, right? That's, I think, John, your comment about design being hard. Knowing what to make isn't, isn't trivial. Um, one of the questions that, that comes up, though, is, is what's relevant here, right? Are you, are you really concerned about, about maintaining an, uh, um, access to the information or protecting the information? Or are you more concerned about um, controlling the technologies that are used to construct or use the information. So I don't know if you want to come in on that, Roger? Or? Well, maybe it's time, it might be time to break, break it out a little bit. So uh, in the regime of patents, um, you have, um, you, you know, in biology traditionally, um, you know, this starts with the, the chemical and companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and so now you have particular configurations of atoms. Um, then you have um, classes of patents that apply to things which uh, somebody from an engineering background might not know about or even think was a good idea at all. Um, you can patent um, and, uh, the idea of nailing a protein, a eukaryotic protein to DNA using a prokaryotic DNA binding domain. You could, I don't know if you did, Wendell, but you could certainly <laughs> patent the, uh, apply for a patent on the idea of a uh, scaffold protein that sent uh, a different protein, a different protein kinase into the nucleus uh, in response to um, a signal that should have activated uh, um, uh, yet another protein kinase. Um, so you can patent broad concepts. You can patent methods such as uh, pulling uh, magnetic beads to the side of a tube using a magnet. Okay, and all of that gets, so you get configurations of atoms, you get ways of going about doing things. You get broad descriptions of those things, and then maybe Pim, you got you 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 you, you get combinations of, of things where you see from these few examples that we've combined that we could do any of this. Uh, actually, the, the sort of, there was actually a, a recent ruling uh, in 2040. Uh, there was the BMS case, the Cox to Never case, where um, <coughs> it was the. Uh, um, this rule that uh, essentially there needs to be substantial description of the uh, molecular composition of the agent that does something. So in the context of therapeutics, at least, if you describe how to inhibit a reaction uh, um, with a compound sufficiently, sufficiently potent to inhibit the reaction, that's not good enough. You have to, so you list typically, there's a lot of patents out there um, that list the, the, the interaction, interaction you want to inhibit, and, but they have just a very uh, general description of the kinds of molecules that uh, it would do this small molecules, proteins, and others, but they don't actually describe exactly which protein uh, uh, does that. And so th these these claims are not held to be valid any longer. Uh, um, and so this is well, this, the claims still exist. Uh, people are now starting to essentially assume that these are not valid. And so, in order to get claims that um, where you describe the component that does something, you'll have to describe in detail. What the, what the, the, there's a description requirement for the protein uh, that does that. And so um, there's a specific ex exception to the description requirement for, for, for antibodies. So antibodies, you can claim any antibody against the target. And that's why we're not working on antibodies for therapeutics. We're using a non-antibody scaffold so that you don't have this limitation. But, but sorry, sorry, you would have to, um, and, and this is more, more clearly developed in therapeutics, but expect, expect logic is similar here, that you'd have to have substantial detail on the composition of the molecule that is going to perform the action. And you will, you will not, you, and you may be get a, able to get a claim that's much broader than what you've shown, but not all small molecules, all proteins, and all other agents. Right. What I'm taking, I, what I, the way I'd laid this out is that you're getting a sense now, a scattershot sense, in a few examples of the regime that now exists in the world of biology, and you may not wish to port all aspects of this marvelous scheme uh, to this new world you're saying you want to build. Yeah, I was going to say that I was a bit confused by where the conversation was going because it sounds like you're giving us instructions in how patent law works, but it seems like what we would want to discuss is how to make the whole system mimic the open source Linux ideology as much as possible and how to basically prevent the situation that has arisen, for example, with stage display where basically aggressive patent lawyers have castrated what is an ideal technology for doing things. And so, I don't know. Here, here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let me propose at this point what I might call the uh, recording artist model. All right, so um, the 
the the problem here is the balance between some return for your artistic creation um, otherwise uh, there's no economic incentive to do anything and the obnoxious situation where um, patent lawyers and patents tie things up uh, unreasonably and beyond all belief um, and extract um, or extort the maximum possible price. Um, so the recording artists, they make a song and radios play it and the radio stations pay a set, very small preset price each time they play the song. And so um, I think um, the features that are desirable about this is uh, uh, it's related mostly to the exact physical object, although you can also have um, 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 some rights on the lyrics. So if you cover it by another artist and so on and so on, you get some variation and both the original author and the recording musician get um, um, some things. So you can modify previous rights. Uh, and that there's some arrangement where the, the, the technology is freely and immediately available at what is ultimately a very low price, perhaps sure. tied to a small fraction of, say, the ultimate sales price if there ever is a sale. Right, right. So that, that's called it the BMI or ASCAP model from the uh, recording industry. And um, that does, uh, among the features of that, you cannot keep anybody else from using your song in their movie. You cannot prohibit them from doing it. Uh, you know, one disadvantage, you, you have to keep, now you have to set up a chain of provenance. Who did what? Who wrote what lyrics? And you have an elaborate cost recovery scheme. But it's not a, you know, it is a model. It worked well in 1985. That was working well. Hey, Roger, you can keep something from using your song in a movie. It's popular. There's an obligatory exception for, for, I look at music shuffling, and there's an obligate exception for, um, an obligate licensing requirement for music. Right. And that's, that doesn't apply to any of the other copy, copyright categories. So I looked at, uh, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's an obligate licensing requirement right. for music. Right. But it doesn't apply to other categories, like art. And, uh, so everybody had to pitch into this consortium, but then everybody gets Let's something else. So so there's another, another model that might be interesting to take a look at, which is the... Uh, semiconductor manufacturing model where <coughs> basically every company has a, a pile of patents and they're they're patents of their very own they're not you know cross you know they're not licensed in any direct way but everybody's cross licensed to everybody else so if you go and you make a, a chip at Intel Intel has agreements with all of the other manufacturers and uh, there really are not any patents issues. I mean, the manufacturers settle between themselves. Basically, they put their pile of patents up against sure. the other guy's patent, pile of patents, and, and some money changes hands. But the end users don't really see that uh, at all. So you could imagine if we transition into a, a situation where, you know, the DNA fabrication becomes centralized, that a similar, you know, sort of cross-licensing approach might be in a, a, a way to, to handle some of these problems. So that requires that it be big, that each of the seven people who plays in that space be big, and um, works against, and I'm going to be agnostic on this, the development of a hacker-type culture insofar as you want that to, be, to develop. So I want to I come back then to the proposal or comment that was raised earlier. And um, if you were to sort of step back and sketch out a wish list for um, what a IP framework might look like in, in, in future uh, biology um, that is inspired by may may or may not be the same as a, an open framework. Um, here are some things that, that it could uh, account for. So um, you might want to have unfettered access to the information specifying the components. So you could simply read and learn about stuff and know what was possible and what was out there. Um, you might like to have unfettered ability to use parts in combination. So I could take one person's zinc finger and another person's engineered protein kinase and make good use of them. Um, I might want to maintain a chain of authorship uh, and that could be distinct from responsibility. So if you're worried about uh, accidental or intentional misuse, um, you might want to know where things are coming from and, and who did what. Um, I'm likely to want to be able to promote um, the development and use of higher level uh, descriptions, what a biology, you know, an annotation of sequence. 
All I mean to say is, you know, uh, primary sequence information is often not human readable without a tremendous amount of additional work. Um, and I might also want to have triggers uh, that promote transparency so that if um, the information specifying a system or the physical system itself was released into the environment, um, that all knowledge of that system and how it worked would also be made available. So this would be analogous to, uh, for instance, how the free software licenses work when the binary is released, the source code must be released as well. Um, so I don't know that this is right or not. It feels, you know, if I were to try and implement something like this, um, a starting point. Um, and, and so I, I put it up in response to the comments from before, but I'd be happy to try and modify this. I have no idea how to, how to implement this and whether it should be implemented at this point. Yeah. OK, um, testing. Okay. So, um, so uh, the extreme case, what happens if, uh, if you have a company, they haven't patented any of their, or they, they are seek, well, what type of patent would um, protect a company which uh, designed their, uh, their biological sensor or medical diagnostic thing, and they've, uh, they're making money, and this other company then just buys their product, they could reverse engineer it pretty quickly, or even just culture their own organism and resell it, and uh, what sort of patent would protect that, protect that from happening? Most sorts of issued patents governing biotechnology do protect against that. So what happens if they reverse engineer it, change a few things? Doesn't count. Still, still patented. Still protected. So at what point is a variant no longer a variant, and a variant is now a new design? And it's what's established the by patent lawyers <laughs> and interacting with the patent office, and the bounds are rather wide. So it would be, it is possible, and there's an issued patent covering, covering bringing proteins to DNA by a prokaryotic repressor. So you, you, well, you know, you can't, you can't reverse engineer it. You can't mutate that prokaryotic repressor and not, you know violate that patent within very broad limits. Okay, so. And many of those overly broad patents actually yes. never really become valuable. <laughs> um, there are overly broad patents in Iran, and uh, the Kaufman patent, for example. Uh, uh, that, the yeah. Kaufman patent. And, no, no, but explain. Um, and so it's... Um, what is that patent? The, well, there's a, a very explain broad... Does, the the yeah. Kaufman patent is any, oh, any yeah. random mutagenesis of proteins, ra random proteins. Uh, and right. uh, there's a number of other uh, uh, very... And they, they essentially they... Uh, they're useful as negotiation pieces, but they're, they're generally not licensed. Nobody licenses them. But uh, that's going against the whole hacker culture, right? That, I mean, you have an right. unfettered right. broad patent protecting a lot of things, and of course, you're not allowing anyone to use it. Right. So that's bad, right? So uh, I just wanted to maybe expand the thoughts about the IP framework. If you go back to the original notion of what IP is and why IP is guaranteed by the Constitution, it's to uh, enable continual innovation. It's, the, it's, it's a promise that you <coughs> will be able to keep doing what you're doing and in fact do better for some period of time. Uh, and one of the issues that's associated with that, I believe, uh, although not listed up there, is um, how fast we want to go or how slow we want to go, how slow we want to enable or how fast we want to enable innovation to go forward. Uh, and if we can control that at all. I just want to throw that out there and add it to the list. Hmm. Oh, okay, so, um, uh, so Drew, I, I wanted to um, expand a little bit on um, Rob's point there. The reason Thomas Jefferson created patents as they, as he, as eventually was implemented in the United States, was to actually create an open source system of a kind. So the point of, point of patents is that you would know exactly what was, how the technology was implemented in order that other people could um, um, use that to make new and better implementations. But with the commercial rights being assigned for a limited amount of time so that you actually could get some commercial benefit. So that, that actually um, is very reasonable because the alternative is to um, use trade secrets as a way to protect your intellectual property, if, if patent law does not give sufficient protection to any particular um, invention, then the maker may decide not to tell you how it works and to use all methods possible to obscure the way it does work and use trade secret protection, which then obscures the information and makes it um, um, unavailable to, for others to make progress. Okay, so that was just a, a broad issue. Now to get back to your original question, I think when you talk about access to used parts, I think you should um, 
divide the issue into two parts. Um, access to actually play with the parts or access to play with the parts and then commercialize what you want to do with them later. So to play with the parts, I think it would be a very natural extension if it's not already true that if you use the parts for nonprofit um, purposes that those part that you should be allowed to do so. And I'm not sure that patent law, I'm not sure exactly, we should ask the lawyer here um, what the exact issues are because I do remember people being sued for using um, correct uh, um, um, TAC polymerase at one point. So, but I think that that small change to patent law to allow nonprofit use of the of the material would be reasonable if it's not already the case, as I don't know. And um, second, the commercial aspects should be separable in this conversation. Just that's that's just clear to me. And, and then, of course, that has to be worked out among the people among. Um, those who are interested. So, so I just want to acknowledge what I'm now hearing is um, two additional points or modifications to to this initial naive specification. One is um, something having to do with the rate of development or application of the technology, uh, and the second is um, access to all of society's resources, basically. Um, you know, profit, not for profit, whatever. Yeah, to get a little technical on what you said, Andy, the, uh, uh, the yeah, we, m m all of us kind of thought there was a so-called research exemption, uh, which <coughs> allows you to use any technique. And uh, the courts ruled quite decisively, I think in 2003, maybe even 2002, um, there's now a federal appellate court uh, ruling that there is no such thing. Uh, that Duke uh, was judged to be a, a, a money-grubbing institution in business, and the business is writing papers and getting grants, and you know, you guys have to pay royalties. Yeah. I believe that patent law explicitly does not allow you to do anything other than study the, flat, the, the, the process described by the patent. Yeah. Okay. It is not, you cannot use right. the patent right. for any useful purpose, including your own research. There's no, there's no, no research exemption. Yeah, but but that could be made explicit in some. And, and some countries have this. So Denmark, for example, has a research exemption, sure. and that's why we have a subsidiary there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I want I want to get I want I want to get to, to uh, oh. Paul, but but Rob, did, did I get that wrong or something? That's why I also just want to throw out that uh, the notion that patents are property is not uh, an old notion. No, so one thing that Lessig keeps pointing out is that. In the, in the sort of space of the internet and associated technologies that uh, well, he, he just over and over calls patents uh, the thought that patents are property is absurd. Okay. Uh, and, and this is not something that was originally intended to be the case, but it's developed to be that way. Mm -hmm. We could decide as a matter of policy to do it differently in the future, although uh, that might be problematic economically. But it's well, what was it? To to the patents were never property. License. license. Patent. Mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. in that line, a few broad points to, uh, to keep in mind. Trade secrets, patents, but the third alternative is putting things into public, which if you're worried about too much private control over, over what you're doing, you can publish them and put them in, in, into the public domain yourself. That means you can't make money on them either, but it means they can't be taken out of the of the public domain, at least not easily. So that's step one. So that's worth considering as a collectivity or as an in a set of individuals, whether you might not want to take your registry and make it public uh, and publish it as quickly as possible so that somebody else can't patent it too, too quickly. So that's step one. Step two, we're now moving, we're already in a global situation in which U.S. patent law is not sovereign and autonomous and, and, dom and dominant. So the European Union has clearly some different ideas about what uh, the scope and limits of patent law is. And the recent the BRCA1 decision uh, where this goes with Pim's point, where since Myriad made some minor mistakes, they invalidated the patent. This is in the direction that you really have to, the, this, the bar is getting a little higher. So the European Union's a second player in this. And then the third player, which is still completely unknown, except in, uh, is, is where China and India and other places are going. And that issue turns on, as we've seen in the AIDS epidemic, whether or not there are any general sense that there's a global uh, commons or a global set of, 
of goods which can limit uh, corporate rights. And in this case, that those battles have actually basically been won. So we're, and now that the, the intellectual uh, infrastructure to do world-class molecular biology and other sciences is now being distributed around the world and is not controlled by the U.S. and Europe anymore, I think we're entering into really a quite different um, domain in which 18th century patent questions, strange enough, may be somewhat more relevant because there were Jefferson and others in the 18th century did have a sense of the, of, the, of the general good in a way that's been rather undercut by industrial capitalism over the last two centuries. So I think you need very specific thoughts about what to do in the next few years about with what you're doing, and you need a longer term, I mean 10 or 20 year perspective about what this new global situation is, mm -hmm. is, is, gonna, is gonna do to the kinds of inventions mm -hmm. um, that, that you're making. So, so I think one possible solution to a lot of these problems, it, well, to the potential limitation of research by companies, you know, if some of the conversation has been towards the idea that there are consortia that get together and cross-license and allow each other easy terms, but you never can exclude the possibility that some evildoer corporation will patent something that, and decide not to be part of a friendly system. They will patent some essential aspect mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do and basically hold everybody hostage. Mm -hmm. And I think one way to address that is to have something like the parts collection, which is going to be central to what we're all doing, be, for example, patented by MIT, and it would simply be announced that this is freely available for research use and for commercial use, you have to talk to MIT. And that way, uh, anybody who tries to further patent things based on the parts would be, could be present, prevented from doing so by MIT. And that way you could ensure. But I don't, I think the idea that it would be, I mean, it, this. I think the goal, the goal is to ensure, first of all, that research use is never per inhibited. But the assumption is that we have to rely on the continued benevolence of MIT. Yeah, the, the world is much bigger than MIT, right? And there's not a chance that MIT deploying all of its resources would be able to develop uh, the set of components that we'd like to have. You know, so that, that, that doesn't seem... So what do you propose happens to the park? They're just in the public domain? Well, so there's, there's, I'm, try, I'm doing a bad job of trying to decouple the problem into one. So I want to I wanna give, get the, uh, uh, Fred the mic real quick. But decouple the problem of what would be the features of a framework by which we would um, make use and share uh, biological information and materials. And then the second part of the problem is what are the tools we have um, to implement that framework, right? So, so probably the more important part of the conversation for us now and, and throughout the meeting is to have discussions about what is the specification of, of the framework that we'd like to try and implement. And then, you know, I'm certainly not qualified to figure out if it's implementable and the best way to do it. So we can, we can think about that, but work towards that later. So. Well, I, I was trying to uh, warn you that MIT is also a corporation, and the, uh, they actually probably own what you've got already, because if you had federal funding in it, they would. If you, if you don't have federal funding, then it's complex. But the Bayh-Dole law basically says that if you've uh, developed it with federal funding, you're obligated to uh, put it in the hands of your, of your institution. No, can, you, can you pass the microphone over one? Yeah, let's hear what you say. Well, uh, I can just say that, the, for, uh, that I have an agreement with MIT. I'm a faculty member at MIT. I've been 30 years, 31 years. I have an agreement with MIT that all of the work that I do becomes GPL. That goes to the GNU, GNU General Public License, and th that has the feature that uh, that it then becomes free to anybody to use so long as it, it propagates the GPL work. Now, whether that would work for patents, and for sorry, whether that would work for, for biological materials, I don't know, but I'm just saying that, an example. You're just talking about software, then? Which no. is, yes, but also I, I also have to ask And, and I, I want to limit the degree to which we're just arguing with each other and try to get the principle that whether I've got it exactly right or just approximately right, there is a Bayh-Dole law, 
and as far as patents are concerned, and they continue to extend this, because it really doesn't say it's limited to patent, that uh, the university is the agent that is considered to uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, be in a position to, uh, and look, this hasn't been tested. What if they go, can they go and confiscate your notebooks and patent your work? I don't know. But I, I, I wanted to get my suggestion out, which is that if you want to set up a new framework, you probably have to get a new organization that would be authorized to collect the IP other than MIT, and MIT might fight you on it. They may actually want these inventions. I'll tell you, I would, uh, I could see uh, plenty of applications for uh, the counter uh, in someone who, let's say, is selling uh, a, a biological uh, bug, and they want to charge you by the amount that you replicated. You <laughs> could, uh, uh, you a subscription use model it for a very commercial purpose, yeah, a very computer. simple idea. It could be used in a very benign, I would say, sort of like a taxi meter. So let's go back there and then new bar. Way up here? No, oh, right. right. By the stand. No, by the stand. Heather, by the stand. By the stand. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to say I think the GPL is an excellent sort of model. I mean, it, it's probably got a lot of holes in it as far as molecules go and a lot of things that are software specific. But in general, I think it's a very good model for the kind of thing you'd like to have to govern the way that the different parts in synthetic biology are used. And one thing that shouldn't be overlooked is that there are the open source doesn't necessarily mean it's free. There are a lot of open source programs that generate money. I mean, a lot of file servers and, and, you know, web servers and things like that are open source, but people still pay for implementations of them or to have them, you know, ported to a particular platform or whatever. And the, the only thing the GPL constrains you to do, you can charge for your, for your software, but you just have to propagate the GPL, as the previous person pointed out, and, and that, that also ensures that your points drew about chain of authorship and transparency and so on. The GPL actually forces you to, to acknowledge who produced different parts of it, but it doesn't mean you can't pay for them. And people do pay for things that are, you know, that could be free because there's an awful lot of time required in figuring out how something works and implementing it and so forth. So, you know, open source wouldn't necessarily mean uncommercial. I just want to add one thing to this, and maybe there are experts who know the answer to this, but it's, it strikes me that the more you're engineering with natural parts and, and you're trying to do things, the more there may be an argument to be made that this is precedented in nature, and the composition of matter claims that you may want to get may actually not be available. So the EST patents, certainly uh, people raise those kinds of things, but, but as it... I think it's, it's important to try to think that through if, if you're doing an unobvious combination of parts, but it has already been done and you can find evidence for it, I don't know how you can actually get the most fundamental patent. And I think once you kind of eliminate that possibility, all the other method of use patents and all that um, will, will be much less of a block than people perhaps are concerned. So it would be an interesting question from my point of view if there are experts, patent law experts, as to whether the, the, the reliance on these natural parts or kind of equivalents of those, slight variations of those, the patent law is pretty clear, don't count, whether that you can make an argument of their uh, pre-existence. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand the scope of the problem that we're uh, discussing. So let me put out one example and then uh, in comparison, maybe you can help me. If, if I if I create a, um, a, a comprehensive uh, knockout library of your favorite organism and then deposit that library in the ATCC, the uh, American Type Culture Collection, right? Then uh, that library, I'm, I'm putting it there uh, to make it available to the research community and to give them the, uh, the to, to put the burden of distribution on them. In what sense couldn't you do that for these uh, these biological parts, devices, and systems? Deposit them somewhere, uh, give give somebody else the job of distributing them, and they you know that at least at at, at cost. Yeah, I, I think that's that's easy to imagine. Um, there are lots of other issues, though. Um, for instance, I myself um, 
am never going to construct or discover or invent all of the components that I might like to make use of. Um, and, and so how do I, how do I implement um, a situation where, and, and I pr presume, you know, that but, we all have. But you just, but you just need a, you just need a magnet for the part. You did, yeah. They wouldn't all come from you. I mean, Barbara Bachman back in the days, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, collected the e, the E. coli mutants for the community, and for, there are there are such uh, curators now, I believe, for uh, most of the model organisms. Why wouldn't that work for the parts, devices, and systems? It's, it's clear for me to me that this discussion is not going to be able to do anything except illuminate uh, issues, touch on them, really. But uh, one of the differences, Eric, is that uh, that I see is that um, you know when you're bolting together software out of pre-existing pieces of software that's protected under various open source licenses. And the, the bedrock, uh, this one hasn't been raised yet, so I'm just going to try to throw out another one. Uh, the bedrock on which the GPL and its, its derivatives rest is copyright. I assert copyright in the code I wrote, and I am giving you a license to use my copyrighted material if you adhere to these conditions. So the equivalent of copyright, copyright is a way to copyright words and lines of code. The equivalent of copyright in the corporeal world is patent. And patent, co copyright costs you nothing to type a C. Patent costs you $50,000, you know, something like that. So just to assemble an open source thing that's, you know, you know, closely based on, um, on, on what's done in software Carl. is going uh, is going to cost. It's going to cost so much. <coughs> that's why MIT has uh, their whole operation set up the way they do. Okay, I want, I want to take Carl and, and John, and then we're going to table this. So I had one question, if you uh, follow up on the, the point, uh, Roger, that you just made about uh, copyright and patent. Um, do the combinatorial aspects of creating complex structures actually differ in these two cases? So if you follow through copyright, you combine A and B to get C, and uh, basically some combined system cannot is infringes if it uses if it plagiarizes any piece. If you combine, right, that's sampling in music, say, well, as opposed to bolting a, together co copyrighted pieces of code protected under the GPL. Yeah. So say you bolt together those pieces of code and make a new thing and claim that that's somehow yours. You can't do that because it's clear where the pieces came from. It is not clear to me if you bolt together publicly available things and make a new physical object, that actually may be patentable because it's yep. a new entity. So the, the logic of combining pieces may be fundamentally different in these two cases. Yeah. Okay, John. Uh, I just wanted to mention two things that relate to this. One is the material transfer agreements for physical objects are can be much like the uh, copyright on music. Material transfer agreements can last forever, but they, they only follow the chain of the physical object. Uh, and the other is I don't see any fundamental problem with the coexistence of an open source materials where you publish and make unpatentable segments of what you use and allow commercial entities to make inventions using maybe those segments and, and their own inventions or their own inventions alone. It, it seems similar to what's going on in the software world and, and, and a really feasible model. You just have to make sure that the pieces you're creating and distributing are uh, you know, published and clearly not patented and therefore not patentable. So, so I'll take one more from Paul, and then I want to keep in mind that the keep in mind that the SNP consortium was put together by nine of, or ten of the biggest pharmaceutical companies around to overcome some of the over parcelization of small patents that the biotechnology industry had created because they didn't have products but they had patents. So, we're you've got to think about this historically as well in terms of how value is generated in the, in, the, in the parts of the world you're talking about and how that's changed. So capitalism is made up of multiple different entities that operate with different interests and at different times. So the, that needs to be thought about um, as well. And the SNP consortium, 
is not the only one of its kind where commercial interests have banded together to overcome lower level patents and the changes in the patenting office in washington are being pushed by big money because to eliminate other kinds of patents which are standing in the way so you need to know in some detail who which commercial interests you're talking about and how global they are okay so um first I'm sorry, we're going to need to move on right now, but but so thanks for participating and putting up with an unstructured discussion. Um, the most important thing I think that's coming out of this is the specification, the beginning of a specification and future refinement of, of some framework, what we would like to have happen. Um, if you have more comments on that, please uh, let me know about that. Um, so. For the last five minutes before we uh, break for the poster session, I've asked Roger um, to briefly set up tomorrow's conversation on risk in biology. So this may be a risky endeavor, but the um, hope here is to just begin to start thinking about that and the poster session will follow soon thereafter. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, next slide. Five minutes uh, introduction to the uh, situation in synthetic biology as I see it um, uh, an example activity that uh, a reasonable person might be uh, accused of constituting uh, might, might think constituted a risk in the colloquial sense of that term an example framework for thinking about what I'm going to call a problem an example tactics and that's the really important point here tactics that one might consider using to try to ameliorate the risk next slide um, so uh, let's compare and contrast with Insilomar. Now, in the middle 1970s, the upsides of doing recombinant DNA research were perceived as very high by the establishmentarian scientists who were trying to promote it. Uh, they foresaw uh, that in the near term that it would be possible to make large quantities of human proteins of therapeutic utility and that there was lots and lots of money on the table. The downsides were generally perceived to be low. They were, most people thought they were probably low. And some of those downsides were addressable by directed short-term research and engineering projects. Uh, can naked DNA be transmitted to mammalian cells? The experiments of the late 1970s said no. Now we think yes. Uh, e. coli, is it possible to make an E. coli that wouldn't grow outside the laboratory? Yes, that's going to be a short-term project. Next slide. Compare now. The perceived upsides are not yet well articulated. Um, uh, the uh, the so-called killer app um, is uh, not necessarily there. The uh, artifacts, uh, the counters and so on, uh, are compelling, I believe, but they're compelling in an austere way. Uh, they, they'd enable research. There's also some difficulty that I've had for uh, n many years distinguishing stuff that's called synthetic biology from existing engineering activities that use biology, biotechnology, the, bi the chemical industry, et cetera. So, uh, and there's no strong synthetic biology specific markets yet articulated. So there's no uh, greed and lure of lucre of the billions of dollars driving the scientists here. Uh, and I'm gonna say by comparison with the 1970s, it's easy to articulate scary scenarios and in fact, there's no particular reason to conduct any applied research because we know that these are real. Next slide. Okay, so this is a different uh, DNA company, John. Uh, th this is from Glenn Evans. So this is a large-scale DNA setup. Next slide. So here's, I'm just going to throw this out. Okay, so SARS Plus. Okay, it, it fits your contest, John. It's a positive strand RNA virus. It's, uh, it's under 30,000. Uh, base pair. So we're going to make SARS plus. We're going to resynthesize it and we're going to add a toxin. Now, SARS is extinct in nature, we think. Okay, and it's, it's pretty lethal and it's extremely contagious. Witness it keeps leaping out of laboratories in mainland China and in Taiwan. So um, we're going to resynthesize, we're going to make the double stranded DNA by full synthesis or by serial recombination in E. coli or in yeast or mammalian cells or plants or whatever. We're going to make the, D the RNA from the DNA to get live virus from the tissue culture cells. We'll have something that's more contagi as contagious and more lethal, and then we're going to infect the hench people, and they're going to cough on people, and then an epidemic will start, and people will die. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay. okay, so now what I think we ought to try for here, I'm going to propose this, and I'm going to throw out some examples, is uh, that uh, you know, this, this group, if it feels self-conscious and self-confident, should articulate a vision in which the plausible opportunities enabled by this are grand. 
and in which the perceived risks are mitigated by some patchwork of measures. Further, that this vision becomes a statement of your strategy to gain support that the work should go forward. And then those individual measures become our number, um, you know, become some of your tactics. So that's, uh, I'm going to propose that's the, 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 that, that's the strategic task, articulate a vision in which the potential is grand and the risks are, 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 are well managed. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to throw out some example tactics and people in the room may not like them at all, uh, which is part of the point. You can't make DNA without a license. Amateur radio operators have to study for tests and qualify for licenses, so do pilots. Writers of computer code do not. Which should it be? You know, uh, sh you know, you know, should 16-year-olds be able to synthesize DNA? Yes or no? You know, I mean, this is something on which I believe you need to have a stance. Next slide. Uh, the emerging synthetic bio doctrine, which I heard about from Tom and Jerry and Drew and so on, wants to decouple design and fabrication because that's a good thing for various reasons connected with how the semiconductor industry played out. So maybe we want to promulgate social norms, making it wrong for most engineers to recouple. Maybe we want to deliberately restrict knowledge about fabrication to research scientists or some subset of engineers who are, quote, trusted, end quote. Next. I'm not advocating any of the, I'm saying that the, you've got some tough things to think about, okay? Um, here's an example. Uh, extreme criminalization. Morris releases the internet worm. He didn't do, intend to do any harm. He got uh, sent us to community service, which he did not serve. And he got a job at a company he started, which he then sold to Yahoo with three of his confederates for uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars during the, uh, the mid-boom, say 1997. Um, he didn't intend to do any harm. Any biomarus, and of course any person or commercial entity that aided him, would already be subject to the mother of all civil liability lawsuits. In fact, I'm going to say that failure to address this point alone could have a ch what the lawyers call a chilling effect on the development of this field. But in addition to civil liability, don't we need, or do we need to say, build and release something that causes harm, and whether or not you intended it, you're going to go to jail for a very long time. And if they ever let you out, it won't be like, oh, you got that hot job in the biotechnology company doing security. No, it's people will spit on you in the street, you know, about like if you were a child molester. So the normative and criminal regime, in other words, de-glamorize outlaw hacker culture now. Normative and criminal regime, this would have to be international, and it's much like the international system of norms and laws that governs world attitudes toward slavery. You know, the world has a common position on this. It doesn't tolerate it. Next. Back to the framework. Remember your articulated version of the possible benefits from developing this field, plus your assembled collection of normative and technical tactics to ameliorate and address the hazards. That becomes your strategy for winning support that this ought to happen. So we'll come back to that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the poster session starts right now, and it's just outside the auditorium. You saw it earlier. And I believe dinner is at 6.30? Yeah. Should be a stand-up comment. <laughs>